was born in Fort Chippewan. That much I know for certain because it's on my birth certificate. I have no memories or certain knowledge of what transpired over the next few years. I was once told by a social worker that my parents were alcoholics and that all of us kids were removed for this reason. Dear Chuck, if I die, try to understand. I did not do this because of you. I love you very much, even though we don't know each other very well. I hope that you can do better in life than I, and keep trying. Things are bound to get better. And you know me, I quit everything. Love, Richard Stanley Cardinal. I cried a lot, you know, and that was the first time in a long time, in a lot of years, that I really cried, like, you know, for something like that, for a person. But now, you know, I don't know, I don't really, I can't really, you know, uh, you might say, it. it's really different, because I don't have, I can't really feel anymore, you know. In June 1984, Richard Cardinal was found hanging from a birch tree in the backyard at his last foster home. He was 17 years old and he was Métis. From the age of 4 to 17, he had lived in 28 different placement situations throughout Alberta, including 16 foster homes and 12 group homes, shelters and locked facilities. Richard left a diary which not only described his hardship, abuse, and neglect during his lifetime, but also revealed what an aware, sensitive, and articulate young man he was. I would be returning to grade two this year. I was not considered an outcast this year. I got my first taste of puppy love with a girl named Heather. I was halfway through the school year when a social worker came to our home and I was to be moved and asked how soon I would be ready to move. I answered one week. I should have answered never. Him and I got along really good. We, I mean, we did a lot of things together. We, we didn't uh, overwork each other, that's for sure. Like I say, we built the bridge down there across the creek and we picked a few rocks in the field and we built a few things, you know, and he really enjoyed it. He, he was a good worker and he, he didn't complain and, and uh, we just enjoyed ourselves. He was company for me too, because, you know, you don't like to do things by yourself. And He talked, but he never did ever talk about his past or I never asked him anything about his past. I figured it was none of my business and uh, we'd worry about the future sort of thing. On May 7th, Richard met his last foster parents, Terry and Leo Crothers, at their farm near San Gudo, 90 kilometers northwest of Edmonton. On the third day after his arrival, Richard nailed a board between two birch trees and from it suspended a rope. When it was discovered, Mrs. Crothers immediately contacted the social worker. She was told not to worry that Richard was interested in bodybuilding and would use the board to do chin-ups. 39 days later, Richard was dead. It was June 26th, I'll remember that date. I might forget every other date, but it was 26th of June. Uh, it was uh, my birthday, and we were going to my son's for supper, uh, kids next door and, and all of us. And uh, I got home from work at about four, and uh, Rick was supposed to have fed and watered the chickens, but he wasn't around, and 
I didn't pay any attention because he hung around over with the kids over there. So then Leo come home at about quarter to five, and then we had to go by five, and I said, well, I better go and find the kid. So I went over and asked Jackie. I said, have you seen Rick? She said, no, as you mentioned, I haven't even seen him at all today. And so that's when I got to thinking. I come back and I said to Leo, well, Jesus, you know, they, they haven't seen him, and he's got to be somewhere. The bike was in the yard. He hadn't gone motorbiking or... In there, so I went down to have a look, and of course, he was dead, you know, he had been for for uh, several hours and was, a, you know, a very hot day and everything. And uh, <clears throat> I didn't touch him. I knew by looking at him that there's nothing that I could do. So I went back and told Tara here to phone the police. And while she was phoning the police, I went and got my camera. And I thought, you know, that this should be uh, observed by other people than me, you know. If it ever got to the stage where nobody would listen to us. It was a little tough to do, but I, I took about ten slides. Then we just waited for the police to come. The next five hours seemed endless for the Crudders. Richard's body remained in the trees while they waited for the police and the crime detection unit to do their work. No autopsy nor inquiry was ordered into his death at that time. Well, we waited for about a month or five weeks or so, and we never heard a word from anybody. So that's when I had these slides develop into prints, and I mailed one to each, the minister, uh, the opposition leader, and uh, Peter Tranchy, and... Uh, which is our local MLA and really tore into me over this uh, a bad taste by sending this picture of this dead boy hanging in a tree. And I said, well, it certainly did get somebody's attention, didn't it? You know, I said, otherwise it would have been swept under the table and nobody would have ever you know, thought anything more of it. It's just been another dead end. And as soon as the media association lady got these pictures, then that's when everything took right off. And of course, everybody then was on the bandwagon, you know. Everybody who was hidden in the woodwork from the government got right up and started speaking out how it wasn't their responsibility and wasn't their fault. Tonight, on The National. Richard Cardinal, he had been young, matey, and lost in the shuffle. Richard had been a foster child for 14 years. He had lived with no fewer than 16 families, and in between he had been shuttled from youth emergency shelters to psychiatrists to caseworkers. Last June, he killed himself. This week in a courthouse in Merthorpe, Alberta, a judicial inquiry is sifting through his life to see what went wrong. Steve Andrusiak, CBC News, Edmonton. The inquiry lasted five days. It was presided over by Judge Walter White of the Provincial Court of Alberta. A shocked media reported the testimony from 21 witnesses, including social workers, psychiatrists, psychologists, foster parents, and program administrators. The hearing revealed serious inadequacies in the child welfare system as a whole. Richard's voice was finally heard. One point emerged clearly. Richard Cardinal never got what he needed most, to go home. I was seven years old, and uh, I remember we were staying at the mission at the time, and the RCMP came to pick us up, and they took us all in, and we were taken to Fort McMurray from Fort Ch there was eight of us at the time. We were all split up and put in different homes. So I was put in a home with my second oldest brother. And yet my other brother, the oldest one, Edmund, was placed in the home by himself. And Richard was placed in a different home. And the girls, I'm not really sure where they went. By the age of six, Richard had already been separated from his family for two years. He was to be moved to his eighth foster home in Lac La Biche, where he would live with his brother Charlie for 11 months. 
After leaving La Clabiche, the two brothers were moved together to the town of Brainette. The debusing was started in Brainette, in the foster home there. And uh, that home was pretty rough, you know. Like, yeah, as you know, Richard had a, a bedwetting problem, eh? And in the mornings, when he got up and he had wet his bed, both him and I would both get a licking for it. And not only that, we had to go outside and get our own stick for them to beat us with, eh? And then that, you know, that happened quite often. And he used to just hit us, you know, just for spite of it, I think, a lot of times. I think he just wanted to see us cry, you know. And his, of course, all the family would stand around and watch, and we'd have to drop our pants, you know. And they had, uh, was it, uh, four girls of their own, and the girls would just stand there and watch us too, eh, while they'd give us a licking. Our next home was in the same town, just a few miles away. This home was good in one way, but bad in a lot of ways. It seemed that for every good happening, there were two bad ones. I remember one night. We were not fed, and there was a bag of raw turnips by our bedroom door, so we ate about three apiece. By the age of nine, Richard was moved to his 11 foster home, the Smith family. He was accompanied by his brother Charlie and his sister Linda. And what were they like when they first arrived? I don't know how to explain. They were quite upset and uh, disturbed, as you would put it. At first, I had to cook quite a bit to get them <laughs> filled up. But then afterwards, they, they were just like any other children. They were content. And... They were contented afterwards. And when we just got them, when I used to put food on a table, they used to just grab for it. They were so scared that there wouldn't be enough to go around. Yeah, I thought this home was really good. You know, all three of us, we really had a lot of fun around here. Eh? You know, the creek that's running by the farm here kind of shrunk a little bit, but uh, there's one certain part where it had rapids, you know, it had the rocks and everything flowing down there, and we'd go tubing down there with the tubes. A few months later, his current foster parents had become frustrated with his bedwetting, and once again, the social worker was asked to move Richard. So then I asked the social worker, I said, uh, help me to get some kind of big rubber. Um, to cover the mattress or because I couldn't find anything in the store to, for the big. And I said, is there something to put on him, you know, so he don't wet? And um, they didn't, they, all they did, they did. The way we were told that Richard was going to be taken away and he was supposed to be getting treatment, special treatment for his bedwetting problem. And he was supposed to be placed back with us which never happened. I had four hours before I would leave my family and friends behind. And since Linda and Charlie were at school, I went into the bedroom and dug out my old harmonica. I went down to the barnyard and sat on the fence. I began to play real slow and sad like for the occasion. But halfway through the song, my lower lip began to quiver and I knew I was going to cry, and I was glad. So I didn't even try to stop myself. I guess that my foster mother heard me and must have come down to comfort me. When she put her arm around me, I pulled away and ran up the roadways. I didn't want no one to love anymore. 
I had been hurt too many times, so I began to learn the art of blocking out all emotions and shut out the rest of the world. The door would open to no one. When Richard left, you know, this place was, wasn't the same. Like, both Linda and I were pretty upset that Richard had to go away, and this place just seemed to have lost its spirit. The social worker arrived to take me away to my new home. On the way there, she tried to talk to me, but I wasn't hearing or trying to hear. When we arrived, the social worker wanted to talk to my parents alone, so I remained in the car. About a half an hour later, she came out and called me but I would not move, and she came to the car. I locked the doors. I did not want her to leave me here. Here I was friendless, alone, and very scared. Finally, they coaxed me out of the car, and I began to cry. The social worker told them that I would get over it soon and left. But I wouldn't get over it, not now. Not ever, I told myself. You know, for the longest time, we never heard anything about Richard. Nobody told us how he was doing. I was taken into the house and shown where I would sleep. The room was in the basement. When I walked into the room, I could not believe my eyes. The floor was covered with water, about an inch and a half. There were boards on the floor to keep your feet from getting wet. The walls had been painted red, but had long before began to peel off. The bed was no wider than two feet across and about one foot off the floor. There was a 40-watt light bulb in the ceiling which was not completely finished, and you had to pull a string to turn it on. It looked like something you'd see in a horror movie. I ran away from here one time. Richard phoned me. He was really upset. He said he wanted to get out of that place really bad. So I ran away from here, and I hitchhiked down to his place. But by the time I got there, it was really late at night. So I went into the bales, and I built myself a little lean-to out of the straw, eh? Out of the straw bales, and I slept there that night. And early in the morning, I snuck out of there before anybody was, got up. And I went and stood in the back of the bush and waiting for Richard to, to wake up so I can go see him. And he came out doing his chores, and then Bob Jones came out, and I was watching all this from the back, eh? and I seen him yelling at Richard for building that uh, straw stack. And Richard was saying that he'd never done it, which was true. You know, it was me that built it, and he gave him a, like he started beating on really bad for building that, eh? and I heard Richard just crying and screaming. Mind you, Joan wouldn't let him come to our place. He just forbid him to come to visit. But I, we did ask social worker that them brothers wanted to see, but. I kept telling myself that this was all a bad dream, that I would wake up soon with Charlie and Linda and the rest of my family in our home in Fort Chippewine, but in reality, I knew that I wouldn't wake up and that this was real and not just a bad dream. I spend the rest of the winter here feeling lonely and very depressed, and I began to seriously think about suicide. Richard lived here four years, his longest stay with any one family. While at this home, Richard ran away several times, stole a truck, shot a cow, and was failing all his subjects in school. At age 13, Richard met the Kesslers, his 13th set of foster parents. Richard would once again live with his brother Charlie. He was had this bedwetting problem, so they decided, well, maybe if they went to the psychologist, you know, so we were all for it, because I knew 
it wasn't medical, it was definitely psycho psychological. Eh? So we thought it would do him good, and we consented. We said, sure. And he went for, I don't know, two or three sessions, and then we started to see a change in him. And I think what was happening was he was bringing out everything that he'd buried. And um, I don't know, it just, I don't think he ever really, they should have brought it right out. And I think they stopped the therapy too soon. Because uh, I found a, well, it was supposed to be a diary he was writing later. And in there he said, I've got all this anger, I don't know what to do with it. And yet he didn't display it to us. I had no idea he had this anger inside. When Charlie was about to turn 18 and would soon have to go out on his own, Richard's sense of loss was overwhelming. His anguish became unbearable. When I woke up next, I tried to sit up, but my arms were strapped down and a sudden burst of pain shot through my neck. It hurt so much I ended up yelling in pain, and then I burst out crying. About two or three nurses came running into my room, and one nurse unstrapped my arms and held me in her arms and repeatedly told me everything was okay now. It felt strange to be held, and yet it also felt soothing and warm inside. I can't remember how long it had been since I had been held by anyone, and I know that I missed it very much. He attempted suicide twice while he was at Kessler's. Once was in school. That was the first time he attempted it. And the second time, he came back from the hospital maybe uh, three days later after that. He was with us at uh, Kessler's. And there's myself and a hired hand. We were down in the barn. We were working. We were building calf pens in the barn. And Richard came down. He was, you know, he looked all right. And, and uh, he said he was going to go up and make a cup of coffee. He says, okay, we'll be up in about 10 minutes. So we just had to finish up. And we went up to the house, and I heard this whining, this moaning. And I thought Richard was singing with the stereo. And I went down to see, and here he was. He was in the doghouse. And I looked inside, there was Richard. He, he had, like, blood all over him. Like He'd written a note. And the note said, help me, please, and it was written in blood. Charlie drove Richard back to the Meyerthorpe Hospital. This time, the attending physician arranged for Richard to be transferred to the Misericordia Hospital in Edmonton. On the way there, the ambulance attendant said that Richard nearly died. On his arrival at the hospital, the doctor reported that Richard was unconscious and smelling of alcohol. No referral information was provided on his previous attempt two days before and Richard was released the following afternoon. We went and picked him up and brought him back to Kessler's, and that's when Kessler's, you know, they said they, they couldn't keep him anymore. And so social services, they sent him to uh, Grand Prairie to a lockup in Grand Prairie. He was supposed to be getting psycho psychiatric help, as they call it. And I don't think he really got any psychiatric help over there. After Charlie's departure, Richard ran away repeatedly. His search for his identity and his family had haunted him all his life. He would aim for the north. He once made it as far as Fort McMurray, a town he had been first moved to at the age of four. It was summer 82. Richard was almost 16 years old. He was charged with shoplifting and was put on probation for six months. The following year, Richard was in and out of shelters and group homes in Edmonton. He was found sitting on a bench at a 7-Eleven store, having cut his wrist and was bleeding onto the sidewalk. Richard had lost the will to live. I'm skipping the rest of the years because it continues to be the same. I want to say to people involved in my life, don't take this personally. I just can't take any more. 
Yeah, I took Richard back to Fort Chip, and he was always talking about going back to Fort Chip. So I felt it was only right to, you know, bury him in Fort Chip, at the, in the graveyard in Fort Chip. And he always wanted to see the family, our family. You know, he was always talking about seeing our brothers and sisters. Richard was about to receive the best attention from the social welfare services in all his time with the department. Arrangements were made for his family members to come to his funeral, including all his brothers and sisters, some of whom he really did not know. It was really good to see all my family, you know, because I haven't seen them for all that many years. You know, they could have at least brought the family together once during all them years. For, you know, a family being separated for so long, what a way for our other brothers and sisters to see, you know, our younger brother. can be gentle as a lamb or ferocious as a lion. It is something to be welcomed. It is something to be afraid of. It is good and bad. Yet, people live, fight, die for this. Somehow people can't cope with it. I don't know. I think I would not be happy with it. Yet I am depressed and sad without it. Love is very strange. Oh, no. 